I'd like to sincerely thank the PCRI for this wonderful opportunity to speak once again. Today's presentation is the Prostate Cancer Survival Guide. And the first part of this presentation is entitled Building Blocks for a Treatment Plan. All right. For disclosure, I always have to mention that the Mayo Clinic and I have received licensing payments for PD-1 and PDL1 immunotherapy related intellectual properties. And this particular presentation is focused on hope, all right? So who's this lecture for? This lecture is for any man who's battling advanced prostate cancer. More specifically, this lecture is for men who have forms of prostate cancer outside of their prostate patients with advanced prostate cancer metastatic disease. So what's the problem? A surprising number of patients that we encounter in our clinic have not been offered the full spectrum of diagnostics or therapeutics that are currently available for the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. I find this incredibly distressing and this begs the question, why? One reason might be that both physicians and patients tend to want to oversimplify the treatment of prostate cancer. Everyone is stressed, there's a lot of emotion, people are in a hurry, and as a result, people want quick diagnosis and a quick pathway to treatment. Bada bing, bada boom. In addition, there's so many diagnostic and therapeutic options available for the management of prostate cancer. On top of this, there are so many different practice and business models that influence the management of advanced prostate cancer. You got urologists, you got radiation oncologists, you have medical oncologists, you have your insurance companies, you have pharmaceutical companies. All of these entities have different viewpoints about prostate cancer and different agendas. I also think so many terms and concepts are misinterpreted or misunderstood. Concepts like standard of care, guidelines, and clinical trials. Finally, there are some really outdated perceptions still floating around out there. These include the view that only old men get prostate cancer or the statement that prostate cancer doesn't kill anyone and the concept that prostate cancer can't be cured. Personally, I find some of these perceptions to be irritating or even offensive. The reality is that treatments are evolving at light speed, and the end result is mass confusion. Reminds me of a song by CCR, Credence Clearwater Revival, Who'll Stop the Rain? Long as I remember, the rain been coming down, clouds of mystery pouring, confusion on the ground. So true, right? So the goals of this presentation are to update concepts pertaining to the biology of advanced prostate cancer, clarify terms and concepts that are often misinterpreted, and finally to provide an up-to-date resource or menu that patients can easily use to create checklists that will enable them to pursue most optimal forms of therapy to manage their advanced prostate cancer. But before I launch into this presentation, I just want to quickly review the basics of advanced prostate cancer so that everyone is up to speed with the terms and the concepts that we will be reviewing today. I can hear Mark Moyad sighing heavily in the background. Sorry, Mark. So once again, I've said this before, prostate cancer is like a dandelion. As everyone knows, prostate cancer first forms inside of the prostate. And like a dandelion, prostate cancer can send seeds throughout the body. Wherever the seeds land, they can grow more prostate cancer. And every site of prostate cancer growth is called a metastasis. Multiple sites of prostate cancer growth are referred to as metastases, like metastases. Finally, 
Every one of these metastases can generate PSA to make PSA levels go up in the bloodstream. As a point of further clarification, even if prostate cancer grows in the lungs, it's still called prostate cancer. Likewise, if prostate cancer grows in the bone or in the lymph nodes or in the brain or a major organ elsewhere, all of those spots are still called prostate cancer. You may also hear medical people use many technical terms when discussing prostate cancer, carcinoma, tumors, lesions, metastases, mets. All of these terms refer to spots of prostate cancer. Finally, you have to remember, even if a spot of prostate cancer is tiny, it's vital to remember that this tiny spot of cancer harbors a huge number of cancer cells. A spot of cancer the size of a drop of water can contain anywhere between half a million to 50 million cancer cells. So now that we've covered some of the basics, let's start discussing, discussing key concepts a patient might need to know in order to optimize his plan for treating advanced prostate cancer. Without question, I think it's imperative to understand the concept of cancer heterogeneity. I've mentioned this before. Prostate cancer cells are not identical clones of each other. Instead, prostate cancer cells tend to be heterogeneous. An obvious support of this, when a pathologist evaluates a prostate cancer sample, the cancer specimen is typically assigned a Gleason grade, which is basically a visual description of the chaotic heterogeneity of cancer cells within the specimen. So where does the heterogeneity of prostate cancer come from? Genetic instability. When a prostate cancer cell divides, it can generate two entirely different cancer cells. This leads to the heterogeneity of cancer cell populations within a patient's cancer. And heterogeneity of cancer cells can worsen over time and with therapy. Specifically, when a treatment is administered, it can set into motion the phenomenon of cancer cell selection, meaning that certain resistant cancer cells may survive treatment or be selected after a specific medication has been given. These selected cancer cells are then left behind to proliferate and spread. Simultaneously, selected cells may continue to mutate due to ongoing genetic instability. The collective process of selection combined with ongoing mutation is referred to as transformation of cancer cells. Transformation of cancer cells can lead to highly resistant cancer cells over time. When pathologists discuss prostate cancer, they are typically discussing three types of cancer cells, adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine cancers, and small cell cancers. In general, adenocarcinomas generate PSA and respond to hormone therapy, whereas neuroendocrine and small cell cancers do not. Adenocarcinomas constitute 50% of the cancers that we see in our clinic, whereas neuroendocrine and small cell cancers comprise about 5% of the cancers encountered. In reality, however, I think the classical view of prostate cancer is far too simple and does not account for the vast heterogeneity of prostate cancer. In fact, I suspect that about 45% of the prostate cancers that we see in our clinic don't fit into any classical descriptions of prostate cancer. Moreover, I suspect that most cancers that we see in our clinic likely harbor a blend of all of these different cell types. Thus, most men with advanced prostate cancer likely harbor multiple tumors 
composed of multiple different cell types that can change dramatically and with treatment over time. From this, it follows to eliminate a bunch of different kinds of prostate cancer cells, it will be necessary to use a bunch of different forms of treatment. So luckily, we have a wide, variety, a wide array of systemic treatments that can be used to combat the heterogeneity of advanced prostate cancer. Here's a list of systemic treatments as of 2023. But before we discuss how to use these forms of treatment, I think it might be useful to understand a little bit about how these treatments work. So what is a systemic therapy anyway? A systemic form of therapy is a drug that will spread throughout the body to treat all sites of cancer, both inside and outside of the prostate. Systemic therapies can cause some or all spots of prostate cancer to either go dormant or to die off. When I think about systemic therapies, I like to further classify systemic therapies into two separate categories of treatment, specifically suppressive treatments and cytotoxic treatments. Suppressive therapies can cause cancer cells to go into a state of dormancy or hibernation. Zzz. So that's like sawing logs, going, going to sleep. All forms of hormone therapy are thought to be suppressive. These therapies put cancer cells into a state of dormancy for months, up to years, but these forms of therapy are not thought to kill off prostate cancer cells. When used alone, these forms of therapy will fail over time, and they can give rise to more aggressive forms of prostate cancer down the road. These suppressive forms of therapy include the popular GNRH agonists and antagonists, including Lupron, Eligard, Zolodex, Firmagon, and Orgovix. Also, oral antiandrogens such as Casodex, Nalutamide, Flutamide are all forms of suppressive hormone therapy. And finally, second generation hormone therapies, also known as ARPIs or androgen receptor pathway inhibitors, such as abiaterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide, are also forms of suppressive hormone therapy. In summary, hormone therapies function to suppress prostate cancer cells, much like standing on the tail of a tiger to keep it in place. In contrast to suppressive forms of therapy, cytotoxic forms of therapy function by killing prostate cancer cells. Generally speaking, cytotoxic forms of therapy are thought to induce more durable outcomes when used to treat advanced prostate cancer. Cytotoxic forms of therapy include various forms of chemotherapy, including taxane-based forms of chemotherapy, such as docetaxel, cabazitaxel, PARP inhibitors, such as Linparza or Rebraca, checkpoint inhibitor forms of immunotherapy, such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, and radioligand therapies, such as 177-PSMA lutetium, also known as Pluvicto. When constructing a treatment plan for advanced prostate cancer, I think it is also very useful to understand how these various drugs actually work against prostate cancer cells. In the medical scientific world, we refer to the way in which a drug works as mechanism of action or MOA for the drug. Understanding the general MOA for these drugs is very vital so that you can construct a broad treatment plan that will be effective against the heterogeneity of advanced prostate cancer. For the purpose of this presentation, I'll describe the MOA or mechanism of action for these one, two, three, four, five, and six different groups of drugs. 
So hormone therapy is a suppressive form of therapy that capitalizes on the 1941 observation that prostate cancer cells use testosterone to grow. Testosterone is produced predominantly by the testicles unless you cheated in pro sports back in the early 1980s. Anyway, once testosterone enters prostate cancer cells, it's converted to dihydrotestosterone, also known as DHT. Dihydrotestosterone then causes two halves of the androgen receptor to come together, and then this complex, which looks a lot like the old lunar landing module, moves into the nucleus or the control center of a prostate cancer cell. Inside the nucleus, the androgen receptor complex interacts with the cell's DNA to stimulate growth and proliferation of prostate cancer cells. Popular forms of hormone therapy, also known as GnRH agonists or antagonists, such as Lupron, Eligard, Firmagon, or Govix, stop the production of testosterone by the testicles. This causes prostate cancer cells to become dormant, thereby arresting further proliferation of these cells. In contrast, antiandrogen agents such as biclutamide disrupt the androgen receptor complex, which causes prostate cancer cells to go dormant. However, after prolonged use of hormone therapy, prostate cancer cells will awaken and become active again, even in the complete absence of testosterone. This phenomenon is mediated by mutated forms of androgen receptor that can function in the complete absence of any testosterone or any DHT. Clinically, this event marks the emergence of hormone-resistant prostate cancer and is typically discovered due to resumed production of PSA and resumed cancer growth. Thankfully, an array of new drugs called androgen receptor pathway inhibitors, or ARPIs, I'm going to refer to them as RPs, RPs, can block activities of mutated androgen receptors in hormone-resistant prostate cancer cells. These drugs include enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide. These drugs will cause prostate cancer cells to once again go dormant. Abiaterone is also in this class of drugs, but abiaterone works differently from the other ARPIs or RPs. Specifically, some of these mutated hormone resistant prostate cancer cells develop the ability to counterfeit their own testosterone. Stranger than fiction, right? And as expected, counterfeit testosterone is used by cancer cells to make them prosper and produce PSA once again. Abiaterone shuts down this counterfeiting activity like Elliot Ness going after Al Capone, putting the cells back into a state of dormancy and once again lowering PSA. So let's move on to discuss some non-suppressive forms of therapy. In stark contrast to hormone therapy, chemotherapy is cytotoxic. In general, chemotherapies enter the cell the cell's control center. There, the chemotherapies, the chemotherapies damage DNA to kill the cells. The main forms of chemotherapy that are used to treat advanced prostate cancer include the taxane-based forms of chemotherapy, docetaxel and cabazitaxel. Other forms of chemotherapy include platinum agents such as carboplatinum, cisplatinum, or agents like VP16. Finally, oral PARP inhibitors, or poly-ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors, such as olaparib or rubraca, also function like chemotherapy. 
Another form of cytotoxic therapy that can be useful to treat advanced prostate cancer is checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. This category of drugs includes agents such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, these agents work by triggering an immune response that attacks prostate cancer cells. Immune cells then swarm on the prostate cancer cells and kill the cells by injecting them with toxins, much like a swarm of murder wasps. Finally, radioligand therapy is another form of cytotoxic therapy for advanced prostate cancer. One form of radioligand therapy that has recently been introduced for the treatment of advanced prostate cancer is 177 PSMA lutetium. This highly specific form of radioligand therapy works by targeting the protein PSMA on the surface of some prostate cancer cells. Doink. Once this radioactive particle binds to PSMA on the surface, of a prostate cancer cell, it's swallowed by the cell. And then the radioisotope delivers radiation to the cell and all cells around it, causing these cells to die. So in the next section of the Prostate Cancer Survival Guide, we will discuss how to assemble a treatment plan. So now that we generally understand how these various agents work, Let's ask the question, what's the best way to create a treatment plan? I generally try to follow several major rules when choosing therapies for my patient. First of all, when one therapeutic agent fails, I always try to consider an agent that uses a different mechanism of action as the next form of treatment. For instance, instead of choosing another form of suppressive hormone therapy, after hormone therapy fails, I might be inclined to select cytotoxic chemotherapy as the next form of treatment. Get it? Second, if a subject is healthy, I tend to be as aggressive as possible up front, and I try to use several diverse therapies in combination to treat advanced prostate cancer due to its heterogeneous nature. Or you might do something like this. Finally, I always try to formulate treatment plans that can whittle down the disease to a point where it might be eliminated altogether. Those who are familiar with my clinic already know that we generally favor curative pathways for treatment of advanced prostate cancer. We are not fans of serial palliative treatments where the only strategy is to hold the cancer down until the cancer becomes resistant and then aggressive and then fatal. Specifically, we try to pursue treatment sequences that are likely to reduce the cancer to something that can be killed off in the end by some form of direct therapy. By doing so, it is then possible to start thinking about rapid de-escalation of therapy so that an individual doesn't need to stay on treatment indefinitely. Related to this, when a woman sees an oncologist for breast cancer, the first words that come out of an oncologist's mouth are surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and these four treatments are offered with intent for cure. In my opinion, I feel that our approach to treating advanced prostate cancer is closely aligned with the aggressive contemporary approaches that are used to treat virtually all other forms of advanced malignancy. At any rate, to achieve this goal, proper sequencing and planning of therapies is imperative. So now let's discuss how a person might use this menu of systemic therapies to combat advanced prostate cancer. In what follows, I'm going to present some of the most commonly encountered cases that we see in my clinic that I feel best illustrate smart options to treat advanced prostate cancer. 
Just as a reminder, today's discussion primarily pertains to treatment of individuals who have rising PSA and metastatic disease. You'll see some abbreviations in my slides. So just for clarification, HT is hormone therapy. ARPI, I'm going to use the word RP, ARPI. You can repeat it with me, RP. Androgen receptor pathway inhibitor or second generation hormone therapy. CHTX is chemotherapy. IMTX is immunotherapy. RTL is radio ligand therapy. And PARPI is a PARP inhibitor, also known as poly ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors. It's a mouthful. So before we plunge into the very complicated world of failed therapies, I'm going to say a little bit about the treatment of newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer. Specifically, Bob is a 67-year-old man who's relatively healthy. He, re he was recently found to have a PSA of 117, clearly abnormal. On the PET scan, he was found to have multiple metastases in the bones and in the lymph nodes, seen by the red arrows here. Biopsy revealed Bob has Gleason 8 prostate cancer. Thus far, Bob hasn't received any treatments whatsoever. What should Bob do? Well, if you're a relatively healthy man with newly diagnosed advanced prostate cancer, like Bob, Triple therapy is probably the best way to launch into this treatment. Triple therapy is the simultaneous use of a suppressive form of therapy such as Lupron, Eligard, Firmagon, or Govix in combination with a second generation form of suppressive hormone therapy such as abiaterone or darolutamide in combination with six cycles of a taxane-based form of chemotherapy usually docetaxel first, sometimes cabazitaxel. Generally, chemotherapy requires IV infusion by a medical oncologist once every three weeks for typically up to six cycles of treatment. However, depending on the response to therapy and the tolerability of treatment, up to 10 cycles of chemotherapy can occasionally be administered. Thankfully, Triple therapy has recently become the IT therapy or the INVO treatment for advanced prostate cancer. Thank goodness. In our clinic, we've used triple therapy combined with directed forms of therapy that we'll discuss later on with curative intent since about 2010. For those of you who have seen some of our previous, previous presentations, I've referred to triple therapy as the deluxe treatment package. Although triple therapy is commonly given to men with extensive metastatic forms of prostate cancer, we also favor use of triple therapy early on for young men as well as healthy older men since use of suppressive therapies alone, such as hormone therapy plus, an, plus or minus an RP agent, inevitably will fail over time. Likewise, we strongly favor use of triple therapy early on in men whose cancers harbor aggressive features such as high Gleason score. But what if you didn't start with triple therapy? Is there still a promising therapeutic pathway forward? The answer is yes. Over the next segment, I'll review some of the most common situations of failing therapy that we see in our clinic. I'm going to try to show you how we use the 2023 list of systemic treatments to best guide yourself or how you can use the list to best guide yourself from one treatment plan to the next. Originally, I was going to try to cover every scenario possible so that you'd never have to go visit your doctor ever again. But Dr. Moyad and PCRI thought that my 76 hour presentation was a bit excessive. Therefore, I've trimmed down my presentation to just touch upon some of the high points. For case number one, let's talk about Eric. 
Eric is a 72 year old who has been on continuous hormone therapy for 2.8 years. Most recently, his PSA has started going up and it's risen from undetectable to 17.2. On a scan, he's found to have cancer in some lymph nodes as well as on bone. What should this patient do? So when a patient is on hormone therapy, his PSA value should be undetectable, meaning less than 0 0.10 nanogram per ml. If the PSA is rising above 0 0.10 and or if he is experiencing spreading cancer on a scan, then that patient is developing hormone resistant prostate cancer. The designation for hormone-resistant prostate cancer is HRPC or CRPC. The little m means metastatic. So the bottom line is, if you're on hormone therapy, your PSA should be less than 0 0.10, and you shouldn't have cancer that is spreading or apparent on a scan. For many patients who fail hormone therapy, an oral second-generation form of hormone therapy referred to as androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, or RP, is often prescribed. Just like conventional hormone therapy, these agents are typically convenient to administer and are also suppressive. In general, the four RP agents that are shown here are roughly equivalent in terms of their ability to control disease. Use of these agents will generate a favorable drop in PSA in about 75% of the patients treated. Treatment with these agents is palliative lasting about one to three years. Another option for men who fail hormone therapy is treatment with chemotherapy. Frontline chemotherapy for hormone resistant prostate cancer is docetaxel. Second-line hormone therapy for hormone-resistant prostate cancer is cabazitaxel. Favorable responses to these chemotherapies can be seen in roughly 75% of patients with relatively minimal side effects of treatment. For healthy men, we tend to favor chemotherapy over RP agents for several reasons. First of all, it's our impression that responses to chemotherapy tend to be durable. In addition, therapy is finite, usually being, usually being completed within about 18 weeks. In addition, we have previously published that men who have been treated with chemotherapy first, depicted by the red line here, seem to survive longer than men who were first treated with oral RP agents, depicted by the blue line here. In addition, we've noted that patients who fail RP agents tend to be very difficult to treat with chemotherapy due to probable hardening of resistance brought on by prolonged treatment with suppressive agents. The reverse, however, doesn't appear to be true since patients who fail chemotherapy first tend to respond very well to RP agents down the road. At any rate, any conjecture that chemotherapy is better than an RP agent is probably a moot point since it seems likely that combined treatment with an RP agent and a taxane-based form of chemotherapy is likely far superior to using these two forms of treatment alone. In our experience, using these two treatments in combination results in favorable response therapy in about 80 and 90 percent of patients that we see. Okay, what about case number two? In this case, Neil is 45 years old, and he's been on hormone therapy for 13 months, but he also started enzalutamide 13 months ago. Most recently, Neil noticed that his PSA is going up. It's no longer undetectable. It's 0.11. He got a scan for this, and the scan shows horrific disease, innumerable metastases spread throughout his bones and throughout his lymph nodes. What should Neil do? 
In our clinic, we encounter quite a few patients who have failed both hormone therapy, such as luprolide, and at least one form of RP therapy. In general, these patients are very difficult to treat, most likely due to hardening of resistance induced by long-term use of suppressive forms of therapy. Nevertheless, these patients do have multiple options for treatment. One therapeutic maneuver that is frequently offered to this group of patients is to simply switch from one RP agent to another. For instance, if a patient was failing enzalutamide, his physician, his physician may switch him to apalutamide. In general, switching back and forth between the various RP agents is a relatively weak maneuver that triggers only transient improvements for a small percentage of patients. I typically don't use this maneuver unless other more robust options have been completely ruled out of course. One exception to this, however, is when a patient is switched from an RP agent such as enzalutamide to abiaterone or vice versa, vice versa. Due to the differences in the mechanism of action for abiaterone versus the other RP agents, strong and lasting improvements in therapy can sometimes be observed upon switching between abiadrone and other forms of RP agent. However, once again, this is only a palliative maneuver. For this reason, and almost without hesitation, when a man is healthy, we strongly prefer taxane-based chemotherapy for initial treatment after a patient has failed both hormone therapy and one, both hormone therapy and an RP agent. In this context, treatment with a taxane-based form of chemotherapy will evoke improvements in disease for about 40-50% of patients. Even better, treatment with a taxane-based form of chemotherapy plus a platinum agent, such as carboplatinum, can generate more favorable responses in about 60-70% of patients after failure of hormone therapy and an RP agent. Response therapy might be further enhanced by switching RP agents at the same time while treating with chemotherapy with a taxane-based form of chemotherapy plus or minus carboplatinum or platinum-based agent. Finally, based on its PSMA-4 trial, Novartis recently announced that 177-PSMA lutetium improved outcomes for men with hormone refractory PSMA-positive disease after failed RP therapy. Therefore, we anticipate that 177-PSMA lutetium may soon become available for treatment of patients who have failed hormone therapy and who have failed at least one RP agent. However, the extent to which radioligand ther therapy can outperform chemotherapy for this population of patients has not been determined and will need to be determined in future trials down the road. One more thing for those of you who are still awake during this presentation, why is Neil's PSA so doggone low? As I mentioned before, as prostate cancer cells become more mutated and more aggressive, they become more chaotic and uncivilized, and they can lose the ability to produce PSA. Therefore, some of the most aggressive and advanced forms of prostate cancer that we see in our clinic are associated with extremely low levels of PSA. Related to this, 20 to 40% of patients who are being treated with an RP agent will exhibit a paradoxical response therapy in which PSA values are declining, but the disease is actually worsening on imaging. Finally, even worse than that, 12% of patients that we encounter in our clinic who are on suppressive systemic therapies will exhibit metastatic disease progression despite 
having undetectable serum PSA value. We refer to these patients as PSA zero patients. The take home message is you cannot depend on PSA values to tell you how you are doing, especially if you're on suppressive forms of systemic therapy to manage your advanced prostate cancer. Instead, you can only depend on imaging to tell you how you're doing when you're receiving systemic therapies. So some patients that we see in our clinic have actually received past treatment with chemotherapy. In case number three, Mark is 52 years old. He's failed hormone therapy four years ago. He also received some docetaxel chemotherapy about two years ago. Now Mark's PSA has suddenly risen to 425. As might be expected, Mark's bone scan shows lots of spots indicating metastatic disease. So what options for therapy does Mark have? So Mark has failed hormone therapy and has previously received some chemotherapy. The most question, the most common question that comes up in this situation is whether or not chemotherapeutic treatment can be repeated. And the answer is yes. Not only can the chemotherapy be repeated using the same agents as before, but it can often be repeated with expectation of a decent response. In addition, chemotherapeutic retreatment can be perfor performed using a second line agent, such as cabazitaxel, and even better than that, retreatment with docetaxel or cabazitaxel can be enhanced with the addition of something like carboplatinum. As I mentioned before, use of ARPI agents after failed chemotherapy works very well. You can get some very favorable responses with RP agents after chemotherapy. Finally, retreatment of patients with some form of chemotherapy retreatment in combination with an RP agent can elicit a very robust response to therapy. So what about men who have failed multiple therapies? So David's a 67-year-old gentleman who's failed hormone therapy four years ago. He was also treated with tax tier chemotherapy two years ago. And he's been on an RP agent for the last year and everything's failing. David's PSA is now 1,328. His most recent scans reveal metastases diffusely spread throughout the bones and the lymph nodes. What should David do? So David's situation is probably the most common situation that we see in our clinic. At first blush, it probably seems like David is in big trouble. However, believe it or not, David still has quite a few potentially effective treatment options available to him. Once again, a patient like David may benefit from trying an RP agent he's not received previously, especially if he's not switched between abiaterone and the other forms of RP therapy and vice versa. And once again, a patient like David might benefit from chemotherapeutic retreatment with either docetaxel or cabazitaxel alone or in combination with carboplatinum. And on occasion, a patient like David might also benefit from other forms of non-taxane-based chemotherapy, such as treatment with cisplatinum or carboplatinum or etoposide. Most recently, however, patients who come to our clinic after failing, hormone therapy, RP, and chemotherapy are offered radioligand therapy with 177PS malotitium, also known as Pluvicto. This form of therapy was first approved by the FDA in March of 2022. In general, a response to this therapy is observed in about 60% of patients who are treated. To date, we've treated nearly 300 men with Pluvicto in our clinic at Mayo. About a third of our patients exhibit very robust response to treatment, especially when disease volume is low. But wait, there's more. Men who have failed multiple forms of therapy can, on occasion, suddenly become eligible 
for treatment with agents such as PARP inhibitor and or checkpoint inhibitor forms of immunotherapy. What? So did I hear someone in the audience just ask, how is this possible? That's a joke. I'm in, in my office giving this talk virtually, so there's no audience. Some patients may say, well, you know, my doctor said that that's not going to work for me. He tested for that many years ago. How can you tell me now that suddenly these therapies are going to work for me this late in the game? This is a great question. In the next section of the Prostate Cancer Survival Guide, we will discuss the proper care and feeding of your treatment plan. Remember these slides? They showed that over time and with therapy, genetic instability generates further heterogeneity of cancer cells. Therefore, treatments that may not have been possible early on might suddenly become more relevant over time. It is for this very reason that we use this comprehensive strategy to follow our patients over time. Specifically, we have our patients follow up with us every six weeks to every three months after starting a new therapy. We repeat blood tests at every follow-up visit, including assessments of PSA, alkaline phosphatase, testosterone. We additionally have our patients follow up with us after every three infusions of chemotherapy, approximately nine-week intervals. And we repeat PET imaging of our patients every three months. On occasion, we also obtain conventional imaging of our patients to get more detailed views of the skeleton, abdomen, pelvis, or chest if we have questions about those areas of the body. Finally, we always have our patients undergo genetic testing before starting any form of therapy, and we always have our patients who are failing therapy repeat their genetic testing approximately every three months. So let's talk a little bit about genetic testing. Many patients that we see in our clinic have not undergone any form of genetic testing. These days, I think that's probably not acceptable. Some patients that we encounter have only undergone genetic testing one time, sometimes a very long time ago. This is also a problem because, as we've already discussed, cancer changes over time and with treatment. Cancer genetics are dynamic. You shouldn't base huge therapeutic decisions on genetic profiles that might no longer be relevant. Other patients have only undergone something called germline testing or genetic counseling. This is probably also not acceptable. Most treatments for advanced prostate cancer or cancer in general are based on somatic genetic profiles. This means that you need to assess the genetics of your cancer and not just the genetics of the body that you are born with. If the only form of genetic testing that has been conducted for you is germline testing, such as testing cheek cells from your mouth by a genetic counselor, that's not sufficient to assess the genetics of your cancer. Related to this, sometimes treatment is being based or assigned based on the tissue biopsy, for instance, from original prostate biopsy from years ago or from a lymph node. Obviously, an original prostate biopsy or prostate specimen from many years ago is what I consider to be yesterday's news and is likely irrelevant to assigning therapy for a patient that has ongoing advanced prostate cancer. Likewise, a biopsy from a single lymph node might not be representative of the genetics of the patient's cancer in totality. Therefore, we typically interpret genetic profiles from tissue samples or biopsies with some degree of caution. Anyway, since it's clear that cancer changes over time and with treatment, we repeat genetic testing roughly every three months in patients who are failing therapy. 
In my opinion, genetic tests that assess circulating tumor cell DNA in the blood are probably the best because these tests likely reflect changes in the genetic profile of the patient's cancer overall and in real time. For this reason, we tend to favor blood sample assessments of circulating tumor cell DNA using kits such as Gardent 360 or perhaps Invite testing. Based on observations made in our clinic, we know that serial genetic testing will show variations in tumor mutations over time. And we typically look for two specific classes of mutations that can be exploited to enhance advanced prostate cancer therapy. One class of genetic changes pertains to mutations in DNA damage repair genes, or DDR genes. Don't confuse this with CCR, which is Credence Clearwater Revival. This is DDR, DNA Damage Repair Genes. The upfront incidence of germline DDR mutations among men with advanced prostate cancer is about 10%. However, over time and with treatment, DDR mutations likely increase in incidence to 30%. Common mutations in DDR genes found in association with advanced prostate cancer include mutations involving the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, as well as ATM and CHECK2 mutations. If some of these mutations are discovered during serial genetic testing, then a PARP inhibitor agent might prove useful for therapy. PARP agents such as Linparza or Rubraca are convenient oral agents that function like chemotherapy. When a relevant DDR mutation is present, the anticipated response, the anticipated response for treatment with a PARP inhibitor is approximately 33%. And these can be fairly profound responses. A second class of mutation that might appear during serial genetic testing pertains to checkpoint inhibitor forms of immunotherapy. Early in its development, we've determined that prostate cancer represents a lousy target for immunotherapy. But we found that prostate cancer does accumulate mutations over time. And some patients' cancers will eventually acquire so many mutations over time that the cancer itself becomes recognized as a foreign predator by the patient's host immune system. At this point, checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy may prove useful to treat the patient's cancer. Specifically, as a cancer becomes more heterogeneous and more chaotic, two parameters called MSI which is microsatellite instability, and TMB, which is tumor mutation burden, can increase over time. MSI and TMB are indices that can reflect the immunogenicity of a patient's cancer. Over time, serial genetic testing sometimes reveals that a patient's cancer will acquire an MSI high designation or a TMB value of over 12 mutations per megabase DNA segment. Such findings might suggest that a patient's cancer can be treatable using either a checkpoint in, or using a checkpoint inhibitor such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, or pilimumab. Using serial genetic testing, we've identified patients who have failed up to six to eight forms of prior therapy who suddenly become candidates for PARP inhibitor or immunotherapy, sometimes with excellent responses. For example, Al is a 75-year-old gentleman. Obviously, so I'm not using anyone's real name in my presentation, just wanna make that clear. And the names that I actually picked for all of my case they're all my favorite electric guitarists, all right? So you'll have to figure out who they are. 
or they're all my favorite guitarists, but that's where I got the names. So Al is a 75 year old who previously failed radical prostatectomy, external beam radiation therapy, hormone therapy, abiadrone, enzalutamide, taxotere times six cycles of treatment. He's also failed a PARP inhibitor for a previously documented BRCA2 mutation. He's failed apalutamide. He's failed stereotactic radiation therapy for oligometastatic disease. He's had palliative radiation therapy and taxotere plus carboplatinum times eight cycles of treatment. This is an average day in my clinic. Now, Al's PSA is 330 nanograms per ml. It's jumped up dramatically. A recent PET scan clearly shows that Al's in trouble. He has multiple metastases throughout the bones and the lymph nodes. So we decided to retest Al's genetic profile, as we do for all our patients who are failing therapy. And a repeat in the genetic profiling showed that he had a TMB value, tumor mutation value of 22 mutations per megabase DNA. Based on this observation, Al was assigned to receive checkpoint inhibitor nivolumab, which is also known as Opdivo. Thus far, Al has only received six of the 25 cycles of treatment planned. Al's PSA has dropped down to 35 nanogram per ml and his scans have markedly improved. As an aside, it's very important for you to always check what type of genetic testing is being done on you. Not all kits will test for key mutations that are important for the treatment of your cancer. For this reason, and probably because we just don't want to think about it that hard, our group uses garden test kits since it examines many of the key mutations that we believe are typically relevant for the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. So I hope I've impressed upon you how imperative it is to have a comprehensive follow-up strategy when treating advanced prostate cancer. But what other useful bits of information might be gleaned during regular and comprehensive follow-up? Well, for one thing, a patient might actually discover that he is not as sick as he thought he was after receiving systemic therapy. In fact, he might even find out that he only has a very small amount of residual cancer that might be amenable to complete elimination using various directed forms of treatment, sometimes even to achieve a curative outcome. In order to identify patients who might benefit from small amounts or who might have small amounts of residual cancer that might benefit from directed therapy, as I mentioned before, we aggressively repeat PET and conventional imaging of our patients who are receiving systemic therapy. I've stressed the importance of repeat imaging in some of my previous lectures. As many of you already know, I do not believe that you can effectively treat advanced prostate cancer unless you visualize it and know precisely what you are treating. Since this topic has been previously discussed in some of my earlier DIY combat manual presentations, I encourage you to go back and look at some of these presentations. If you scan this code here, it will take you to those previous lectures, but don't scan the code right now, because if you scan the code right now, then you won't watch this lecture, okay? At any rate, there are multiple ways that residual disease can be eliminated after completing systemic therapy. For instance, at Mayo, as I've shown you before, we re routinely use surgery to eliminate disease in the chest and in the pelvis. So for example, here's a patient that completed systemic therapy and there's just one spot of cancer left over. It's a lesion in the chest. We have a dedicated thoracic surgeon at Mayo who does our chest cases for advanced prostate cancer. He resected this one lesion. PSA went from 1.1 down to undetectable. 
It's a year out, patient's doing wonderful. Just like the surgeons, the radiation guys, or the radiation um, faculty are, are able to eliminate various forms of residual disease after systemic therapy, and they have all kinds of tools, and I tell you, radiation has really become remarkable. They can basically eliminate virtually everything except for widespread systemic disease. So using stereotactic radiation, such as SBRT, they can they can remove oligomastatic disease. Here's an example of a patient that we presented 11 years ago. This was one of the first cases of solitary MET or oligomastatic disease that I brought up at a PCRI conference about 11 years ago. This patient had a PSA of 1.2, had a lesion on his lumbar spine, got treated with stereotactic radiation, and 11 years later, no further therapies, doing great. Likewise, same kind of patient, has a single spot in the middle of his breastbone. 10 years, nine months ago, we irradiated that with stereotactic radiation. The disease is gone, stay the way. The radiation oncologists also have general radiation can, that can be used to mop up residual disease in places like the pelvis or the retroperitoneum. They can also use stereotactic radiation now to even go after lesions inside the prostate that have sometimes even been irradiated before. Alternatively, minimal invasive procedures such as cryotherapy or thermal ablation can also be used to eliminate residual disease following systemic treatment. This includes residual disease in the prostate, this is a case that was done by Dr. Minders and Dr. Woodrum here at Mayo Clinic. They're experts with cryoablation and thermal ablation. Here's a patient that had a little bit of disease left in his prostate after systemic therapy. This patient received either thermal ablation or cryoablation. It's doing wonderful. PSA dropped down to 0 0.31. Minimal invasive procedures can also be used on bone and in lymph nodes. And minimal invasive procedures can even be used to eliminate disease from the liver. So here's a gentleman that Dr. Woodrum worked on, PSA 3.7, liver lesion. Dr. Woodrum did an ablation on this. Two years later, patient has undetectable PSA, no evidence of disease recurrence. So this brings us to the last part of my talk. And finally, at the very beginning of my presentation, I indicated that many of the patients that we see in my clinic have not been offered a full spectrum of diagnos diagnostics or therapeutics that are available for treatment of advanced prostate cancer based on my observations over the last many years. I do believe that one major reason this occurs is due to misinterpretation or misunderstanding of several commonly used terms or concepts. These include standard of care, within guidelines, and clinical trials. We see a significant number of patients in our clinic who are told that they cannot undergo a procedure or specific treatment since it's not regarded as standard of care. Many patients take this as some kind of gospel sometimes with tragic consequences. What you need to know is standard of care does not mean gold standard of treatment, all right? Instead, standard of care really means acceptable bare minimum treatment, okay? It's just like the term shelter. The basic word means something that covers or affords protection, but a shelter can be a shack, or it can be a mega mansion, kind of like the one that Mark Moyad lives in. Therefore, it's important for a patient to realize that the term standard of care encompasses a very broad swath of available diagnostics and therapeutics for the management of advanced prostate cancer, ranging from bare minimum to an acceptable level or average level to an exceptional level of care. In fact, for patients with advanced prostate cancer who have failed some form of therapy, 
many professionals would absolutely agree there is no real single standard of care. Finally, it's important for a patient to realize that he's fully entitled to the highest levels of care that he so chooses. If a patient is being told he cannot undergo a certain diagnostic evaluation or treatment because it's not standard of care, I would strongly recommend that the patient challenge that or seek a second opinion. Likewise, a fair number of patients that we see are told that they cannot undergo certain forms of diagnostics or therapeutics because these things are not within guidelines. There's no question that guidelines are important to define some basic boundaries of clinical practice, but guidelines are like guardrails on a road. Guardrails define extreme edges of the road, but they don't define the journey. Once again, if a patient is being told he cannot undergo certain diagnostic evaluations or treatments because it's not within guidelines, I would strongly recommend that the patient consider getting a second opinion. Finally, I'm occasionally alarmed, to say the least, to encounter a very sick patient who has received clinical trial treatment in lieu of a useful FDA approved form of therapy. In fact, some of the patients that I see in my clinic haven't even been told that these other therapies are out there and instead are put on clinical trial. For 11 years, I served as the chair of the Institutional Review Board here at Mayo. In this capacity, I was in charge of overseeing the safe and ethical conduct of human subjects testing. Needless to say, based on what I encounter in my clinic, I do sometimes worry that patients are not being sufficiently educated or informed about the role of clinical trials in their overall care. Specifically, I think it's absolutely imperative for a patient to understand that clinical trial does not mean state-of-the-art therapy. In fact, the likelihood that a candidate drug or treatment will pass through all the hurdles to succeed and get FDA approval for solid malignancies at best is 5 to 10%. Patients on clinical phase one and phase two trials gain very few benefits from being on trial. Maybe slightly higher benefits are extended on phase three clinical trials. However, benefits extended to a patient on a clinical phase three trial might still be quite limited since these trials tend to be randomized and definitions of benefit may be modest at best prolongation of survival for an average of two months. Even worse, you might be randomized to a control treatment group in which you receive a minimal form of standard care therapy until you exhibit significant radiographic progression of your disease. As a result, you might significantly delay your access to a useful next step therapy. At any rate, although it's clear that clinical trials are vital for the development of new drugs, no doubt, I think you should review all treatment options that are available to you prior to enrolling on a clinical trial. When in doubt, have other physicians or healthcare providers review the clinical trial protocol with you before you enroll, and always be fully informed, and always ask lots of questions. And finally, please realize that signing a consent is not the same as signing a contract, okay? I hear a lot of patients say, well, my doctor said I can't get off the trial because of this or because of that or because, no. Participation on a clinical trial is entirely voluntary. You can leave that trial at any time and there should be no course of action taken against you, all right? If you believe you are receiving questionable treatment on a clinical trial, contact the Office of Human Research Protections 
These are the addresses and phone numbers. In summary, the management of advanced prostate cancer is not simple and linear. Instead, it's a complex and multi-dimensional problem, but it's not insurmountable. At any rate, I hope this presentation will be helpful to those of you who are currently undergoing evaluation and treatment for advanced prostate cancer. Please take the following lists I've prepared for you and carry them with you at all times when you meet with your healthcare providers. And always ask your physicians about the, net, about the items on these lists before you commit to your next form of treatment. So this is page one of the list, page two of the list, page three of the list. I threw in some of our previous lectures in case you wanna look back on things, we might update this to include this current lecture. That's my email, that's the office phone number. If you got questions, we'll try to help. This is my team, believe it or not. I have the best clinical team in the world. We're kind of horsing around a little bit here, in case you can't tell. But I have an exceptional team. This is, we call it the Quan team at Mayo. These people are truly expert and they care about your problems and they care about your disease and they'll do everything possible to help you. I also work with some of the most talented people in the field. Our pet group and our radio ligand group here is probably tops bar none. Dr. Johnson, now we have Oliver Sartor at our institution. Our minimal invasive group, Dr. Minders, Dr. Woodrum. Our surgeons, Dr. Carnes, Tollefson, Frank, Shaw, Dr. Kana. Our radiation oncologists are exceptional. Dr. Chu, Dr. Wilson, Philip Stish, Davis Park. They're all the best. These guys are like Da Vinci with a, with a paintbrush. They can paint the Mona Lisa. See, I know that the Mona Lisa was painted by Da Vinci. We have outstanding thoracic surgeon, Dr. Cassavy. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention to the video and I hope this is useful. Bye-bye.